Welcome to Embracing the Fight. I am Erica Lamar, your digital creator and host. Thank you so much for joining me this episode of Embracing the Fight. This is a very, very difficult um, topic or subject for me because as you know, I have been trying to see what's next in my journey with this thyroid cancer. I have not been back to the doctor and I did not do my labs right away, but my labs are scheduled for this week and I'll be seeing the doctor sometime this week to discuss, you know, what they found, any options, things of that nature. And I've noticed some phantom feelings when I swallow. It feels like I still have like a lump in my throat, but I talked to a few people that have had the uh, surgery and they explained to me that it's pretty normal for you to go through that from time to time because your body has those same sensations as if something is still there because it was there for so long. But I'm still going to get it checked out to see, you know, what all is going on. But on top of that, the one thing that I really wanted to uh, focus on today is concerning, you know, mental health. What exactly about mental health? Insecurity. Uh, so I, I listen to a lot of different podcasts and a lot of people come to me and talk to me about various subjects. And it appears that the underlying issue of it all is an insecurity in some form or some way. For instance, let me give you an example of something that has changed the way that I move, you know, as an adult. So without naming any names or saying anything about the people that directly did this to me, but I was a child and I was singing in the choir. Well, this was one of the first times that I had actually sang in front of people because I was always a little speaker. I was always the one doing the oratorical contests. And it was nothing to me to get up in front of people. But it was just a matter of, okay, now I have to actually, you know, carry a tune. No problem. So they taught me the song and I sang with another uh, young lady that was in the choir. And everyone was telling me, you know, how great we sounded. So as a little kid, you know, I'm I'm all excited because I didn't know that I could sing. So I thought, well, I had left the choir stand and went back in the little choir room to grab my stuff. And I'm still, you know, smiling and happy and everything. And as I'm coming out, there's a lady that's, you know, in the church that goes over to the choir director and the pianist. And she says, don't let that other little girl sing ever again. That was horrible. You shouldn't let her sing. And I'm a little kid and I'm hearing that. And it's like, well, were all those other people, you know, just, just trying to encourage me? Were they they lying or, you know, what what was it? Because think about it, I'm, I'm a fresh new Christian at this point. Because I, don't, I joined a church when I was like maybe nine, ten years old. And I joined the choir, I joined the usher board. I did, you know, everything that, you know, you can do at a Baptist church back in the 80s, you know, 90s. So I'm hearing this and my little spirit is broken. And I didn't say anything, you know, to my parents about it. I didn't say anything to my brothers and sisters, my brother and sister. I just kind of, you know, kept it to myself until, you know, pretty much adulthood. But... All through my life, I would never volunteer to like lead a song or anything like that. I would always, you know, shy away from it and say, you know, no, that's not, that's not me. That's for, you know, other people that 
can really sing. Well, fast forward, I was in college and my freshman year, one of my roommates, beautiful voice. I said, hey, you know, you should get in that uh, talent show. It's going to be at Nance Hall, you know, in a couple of weeks, I think you should get in it. And she said, I'll get in it if you'll sing with me. And I was like, why in the world would you want to sing with me, honey? I can't sing. She's like, I've heard you sing in the shower. You have a beautiful voice. And I still reverted back to that lady, you know, back when I was a child that basically said, you know, that don't, you know, don't let her do that because she doesn't sound good. You know, don't ever let them do that. But I realized, you know, that that was just one person's opinion, you know, as an adult. So I said, let me go ahead and, you know, sing with her. So we got up and we sang uh, Silver and Gold. And once we finished singing, we got a standing ovation. And I was like, okay, so maybe we do sound good. Or maybe they were just, you know, cheering for her and not necessarily, you know, for me. Maybe they were, you, I don't know, whatever. So I was I was all right at that point. But then I um was online, you know, pledging Delta and we all were singing a song and one of the one of my line sisters, you know, she walks over and she's singing with us and she's like, "You're not singing the right tone. You're not singing the right." And I knew who it was that wasn't singing the right tone or the right, you know, key. I just was like, okay, whatever. I said, I know, I know this song, you know, it's, it's nothing to it. But I could still feel that little person, you know, inside of me that heard when I was a child that you're not supposed to let this one sing out loud. You're not supposed to let them do this. You're not supposed to let them do that. I mean, it was so rough uh, growing up that, you know, in, the, in that, uh, particular church, not because of the kids, but it was mainly because of the adults. And it was because, you know, my parents didn't have, you know, a college degree and they didn't have a big, nice, fancy home. Everyone, you know, that was an adult, I would say not all of them. There were some sweet people over there that, you know, truly shaped or helped shape, you know, my feelings and thoughts about, um, you know, Christians in a sense. They were actually really good Christians, but this particular uh, lady and some of the ladies that uh, were with her, they didn't want us to count the money, you know, after Sunday school, because they would basically say, oh, they're going to, you know, take something from the pot. And I'm sitting here going, we don't have to take anything. You know, my dad works. He provides for us. We don't, we're not lacking anything. We're, we're, we're not vagrants. We don't steal. You know, what's wrong with you? And it was like everything that we tried to do, you know, as, as kids there, my sister and I struggled more, say, than my brother did because, you know, my brother, he was just kind of, you know, just whatever. But my sister and I, we would hear, you know, the grumblings and things, and we would wonder, like, what in the world did we do wrong? So all those things, you know, poured into our lives as a form of insecurity. So to this day, I still don't like sing a whole lot in crowds or in front of people or things of that nature. I've joined, you know, choirs and I've sang. I, I actually um, was at a church <laughs> in Birmingham and one of the guys that was on the praise team, I don't, I can't remember, you know, how he heard me sing unless I was singing him something over the phone because he said that he thought that I had a pretty voice. I think, I want to say I was standing behind him in church. He heard me singing. And then we were talking one day and he asked me to sing him something again. And I did. And he was like, you need to be, you know, on the praise team. And still, I was like, oh, what, you know, what is it? Why is it that I can't shake that feeling? Even though I know when... I sing, it doesn't sound bad, you know, but I'm not Fantasia either. But at the same time, I have that little piece of me that's saying, you know, what is wrong? You know, why, why can't, you know, I get past this? And then I started thinking that, you know, insecurity comes in so many different forms. For me, it was, you know, when it came to singing and performing in front of uh, people, it was almost like I had told myself, 
you know, that I had performance anxiety. And here I am, you know, in my 20s, like, performance anxiety? What the heck? Why am I even giving it a label? And once you give something a name, you've basically spoken life, you know, into that thing. So I want you to kind of think back and think of those things that you've stopped yourself from doing or you've restricted yourself from being a part of because you allow someone else's thoughts or feelings to impact who you are and how you move, which was basically the birthplace of that particular insecurity. Now, the other thing that I was thinking about, you know, when it comes to insecurity is knowing, you know, really what it is that I put out. And when I say what it is I put out, it's like when I meet people, first thing they say is, oh, you seem like such a really nice person. You're you're warm, you're kind, you're giving, you're all these different things. And you, you, you know, you know who you are. Like, I know who I am. I know that I'm a really good, nice, wonderful person. Great. I know all that. But the insecurity comes in when they say, well, why aren't you married? Or why don't you have kids? So automatically then, in my head, I'm like, you know, it's really nothing wrong with not being married and not having kids because maybe that's not the way or the path that your life was designed, even though you may, you know, desire it. And then people start coming with all other things like, oh, you just, you know, you, you picking way up here or you're not picking what, you know, is truly available to you in a sense. And it's, it's like, where do people come up with this stuff? So it's almost like there's a specific design or there's some mold that is out there that everyone thinks that everyone should fit into. But if that were the case, the world would be a very boring and very bland place. So when I go out, you know, I don't meet as many people as I used to meet. And I say that because I was extremely sociable when I was, um, say, in my 20s and 30s. And once I started getting in my late 30s, early 40s, working a whole lot, you know, that that social scene changed a whole lot. Now, I've never been one to really go to the club or things of that nature. I've been, you know, maybe I can count them on one hand how many times I've actually been to a club. But as far as going out to different events and going to meet people, all of that has kind of slowed down for me. But then that sends me to ask myself the question, is that why, you know, you're not meeting a whole lot of people? But then I ask myself, or is it because I'm remembering who I used to be and I'm comparing my old self to my new self? So follow me for a second. I always joke around and tell people, you know, when I was in college and I was playing tennis and my early 20s, well, really up until I was about 30, I always say I was finer than frog hair, finer than cat hair, and you couldn't pinch an inch and all that. Sure. I mean, I, I had it going on. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, you know, funny to say out loud, but you, if you listen to what I just said, I said had. Now, I still think that I'm an attractive woman and, you know, I don't have any issues or anything like that. But I know that I'm not the size I was back then. So that in itself, you know, brings a different type of, you know, person to you to start. Because, you know, regardless of what people say, they try to say, oh, you need to look for someone with this kind of personality. Well, you got to be able to look at them, you know, first. Not saying you're looking at them for them to be extremely attractive, but there has to be some level of attraction when you meet these people. You're not just going, you know, cover your eyes and duck, duck, goose and, you know, pick somebody. No, someone's going to see you or you're going to see them. They're going to catch your eye. You're going to catch their eye. And a conversation starts from there. But if you're dealing with the insecurity of saying, this is what I used to be and I want to be better but you're not doing anything to make yourself better, then you're doing nothing but wasting time and using insecurity as a crutch. So I told myself, 
exact same thing. So I've been doing, you know, boot camp. I've been trying to eat right, except for today. I had some Dairy Queen. <laughs> the ice cream is delicious. And, you know, things happen. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do better. But I know that regardless of having extra pounds or even if my hair would have fall completely out, I still feel like I am a beautiful person. And I want you all to feel the same way. So what I want you to understand is that each one of us has a very, very specific purpose, something that we must fulfill. But guess what sneaks in to keep us from fulfilling that purpose? You guessed it, insecurity. Insecurity sneaks in to steal that joy from you. It sneaks in to steal the options, the thoughts, everything that you think that can advance you. That little thing called insecurity will come in and say, you can't do that. You're not who you used to be. You don't know the people you used to know. You don't run in the same circles you used to run in. None of that exists for you anymore. You got to start over. When all you have to do is take the first step. All you have to do is believe. Because you've gotten this far through trials, through tribulations. And every time you go through something, you get stronger and you get wiser. So you use that strength and that wisdom to get past the insecurity, to step towards a purpose. So I'm saying all of this because I want to encourage you to reach your purpose and to lose the insecurity. Whatever it is, call it out, work on it, and eradicate it. Don't let it become the reason that you never became your best self. For instance, I know that I can't sit like on my feet right now. And I go to the boot camp and I was uh, looking at everybody, you know, sitting down on the ground. They sitting so comfortable. People got their, you know, their bottom on the ground with their knees down and their feet. You know, they're sitting on their feet. And I'm like, you know, up on my knees, kind of perched a little bit. And so I was talking to... Uh, the uh, instructor one day and she said, you know, if you want to be able to sit on your knees, you have to be able to practice it. She was like, I know you've had knee surgery because you explained to me that you were uh, once able to sit on your knees. I This hasn't always, you know, been this way. She was like, how you start is you start off with a really big pillow and you sit as far and as long as you can down on this pillow. Then you keep, you know, getting a smaller one, smaller one, smaller one until you get to a point to where your body has flexed and, you know, gotten to that level. And I told her, you know, that I had the uh, knee injury and the knee surgery and everything. She was like, but you could still, you know, try the stretching and try, you know, to get to it and yoga and everything. So I said, I'm going to try it. And I'll update you all on my fitness journey on next week. I'm going to do my measurements because I'm trying not to do it, you know, as much because the more you do it, you know how they say a uh, watch pot never boils. So next week, I'll show you my measurements and then I'll give you the comparison from when I started to now. And I was told not to look at the scale. So I haven't been looking at scale, at least not every day. <laughs> I sneak it every once in a while and check it out, but not every day because they find that, you know, you can lose inches before you lose weight. And looking at the scale sometimes can discourage you. So I don't want anyone to get discouraged, especially not if you are doing this journey with me. And I really appreciate those who have been holding me accountable. So now I'm asking that you continue to do everything you can to reach your goals concerning weight loss and concerning getting rid of these insecurities. I would love to hear your stories. I would love to bring you guys on so you can talk you know, to, to the listeners so everyone can hear, you know, that, that I'm not alone. I'm not the only person that's dealing with whatever it is they're dealing with. Because that's what this show is all about. It's all about normalizing the conversation surrounding physical and mental health issues and concerns. So if you normalize a conversation and you talk about it, those things get out in the open and they go away. 
But if you hold it in and don't say anything about it, you've allowed whatever that thing is to win and have control over your life. Don't you want control? Don't you want to rule and run your life? If that's the case, reach out to me at operations at diversitydesigned.com. Again, that's operations at diversitydesigned.com. I would love to have you on my next show. And also that, that email address will be in the show notes. So if you want to email me, if you want to ask me a question, if you want me to talk about anything in particular, I would love to hear it. And I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day, your busy schedule, to listen to another episode of Embracing the Fight. Thank you so much and have an amazing day.